Well, today is the last day of a gathering of uh, leaders from business, non-governmental organizations, the church and the academy from all around the world, from Africa, from Asia, from Europe, from Latin America, from North America, to discuss God's purposes for business, especially in the face of poverty. We've been talking about how business has been underutilized in advancing the kingdom of God and how Christians in for-profit businesses can be agents of transformation. You saw in that video about Hagar, a central component of their ministry is a business, a real business, a real for-profit business. You can participate in this gathering uh, by hearing reflections from several of the participants and by asking them questions at a special session that will be held tonight at 7.30 p.m. in Barrow's Auditorium. And you'll be able to participate this morning by hearing from one of the participants, theologian and educator Ruth Padilla de Borst. Ruth has a master's degree from the Wheaton Graduate School, and she's currently pursuing a doctoral degree in missiology and social ethics from the Boston University School of Theology. She serves as the general secretary of the Latin American Theological Fellowship, is a team leader for the Christian Reform World Missions. She's the director of the Edition Certeza Unida Publishing House and is leading the Institute for the Promotion of Christian Higher Education in Costa Rica. I'm not even going to tell you about all the things she's done in the past. And in all that she's doing, uh, we are blessed that she could take a moment uh, to come and, and, and join us at this consultation uh, on business and poverty. Uh, Ruth is a wonderful antidote for an individualized faith uh, that focuses on the self. Her words remind us that we're called to move beyond ourselves and to serve others in the kingdom of God, which means serving those in greatest need. Like any antidote, like any medicine, uh, her words aren't always easy to take, uh, but they're good medicine and they're good for the soul. So please join me in welcoming Ruth Padilla de Boers. Good morning. Good morning. This is pretty awkward. <laughs> and um, when you get NGO people, business people, theologians, church people together, there are plenty of things we work to agree on, and there are plenty of things we maybe don't necessarily agree on. But I think this group over here will, will attest to the fact that we do agree on one thing about these days at Wheaton, and that is that we've had very good food. <laughs> Maybe actually too much food. For you that are visiting campus, I think that's something, if you check out the things, Wheaton is up pretty much up at the top, right? My 16-year-old son told me that. Now, talking about food, and God's table of plenty. I want us to think about daring to welcome others to the table. How many of you have seen Babette's Feast? Let me tell you a scene of this movie. Split cod and ale, that's all they've eaten for years on end. But today the sisters' table is sumptuously spread with exquisite fare that awakens all senses. With lavish love, the servant Babette has spent even her last cent on this banquet, and no one who partakes of it is left unchanged. An estranged couple kisses in forgiveness. Two sisters discover the bounty of creation, and a stray general is struck and says, grace makes no conditions. It takes all into its bosom and proclaims amnesty. That which we have rejected is poured out on us. Babette's Feast, Gabriel Axel's 1987 film that's well worth watching, ushers us into the theme of God's banquet table, reflections on economics, immigration, and us. But how can you talk about bountiful banquets, you might ask, when most of the world barely scrapes by in hand-to-foot survival? Bounteous banquets, those are things 
of fairy tales, of maybe of movies, but they're far removed from reality. And the accompanying scenes of community, of forgiveness, of grace, well, those are even too grand to imagine. The aches and the pains of our discombobulated, frantic lives, the moans and groans of a world borne down by injustice and poverty, the sobs of exploited land and rivers. How can you talk of abundance and bounty? Well, dare I do, and dare we must, and dare we can, because pain, injustice, and abuse of creation are not the whole story. In Luke 14, we meet Jesus at the banquet table of a Pharisee leader. The air is pregnant with tension. Jesus has just daringly healed a man with a severe illness under the scrutinizing eyes of his critics. He has just challenged religious and culturally acceptable and highly discriminatory seating arrangements. And now a well-fed guest raises his cup in pious, self-assured exclamation. Blessed is anyone who will eat bread in the kingdom of God. Of course, anyone in the vocabulary of this, of many privileged Judean scribal groups and Pharisees, applies to a rather circumscribed circle of influential men, not precisely to an uneducated Galilean peasants, even less to despise the Samaritans, and never, heaven forbid, to unclean Gentiles like occupying Roman armies or foreign traders. Blessed in this man's mind is a qualification limited to people like him. Sons, any daughters of Abraham, who abide within the same social, cultural, and religious framework as he does, who at least publicly interpret Mosaic law carefully, according to tradition, and apply it rigorously. They are the chosen of God. People from outside that enlightened circle, they can maybe gain some limited access as long as they submit to the social religious standards of the insiders. Jewish proselytes can draw close by means of circumcision, baptism, and submission to Jewish law and practice. Theirs is a rather exclusive banquet. Now, as the story goes, Jesus doesn't overtly counter the pious affirmation of the dinner guest. Instead, he tells a story about a great dinner. The table is abundantly laden. However, when sought out, the initial invitees begin to make excuses, alleging more important occupations. Of course, they are wealthy, powerful people, capable of buying land, of purchasing five yoke of oxen for a proportionately big plot of land, and they're particularly respected in their city. But their refusal to attend is not taken lightly by the host. So countering all cultural expectations and rules of table etiquette, the host sends, not for friends, brothers, relatives, or rich neighbors, but for who? The host sends for the poor, the crippled, the blind, and the lame from the roads and lanes, the relegated people from outside town. At the table of God's kingdom, Jesus dares suggest it is precisely the people excluded from the economic, social, cultural, and religious establishment that are the celebrated guests. Jesus harkens back to a vision of God's kingdom often forgotten in his day and distorted too frequently throughout the history of God's people. 
the good news Jesus incarnates and announces is not really new, though it does need to be witnessed and proclaimed afresh. Unexpected guests are welcome at God's table. The good news begins with the story of creation. Though cast in a particular language and cultural ethos, its implications are universal. All humans are created in God's image as relational, creative beings and are called to shape family and community, to produce culture and science in relationally responsible ways, multiplying and filling the earth as expressions and agents of God's good purposes for all of creation. When humanity is tempted to concentrate numbers, power, and wealth in one place at Babel and runs the risk of establishing hegemonic and life-defying uniformity, God disperses them, safeguarding diverse cultural expressions and languages. When God calls Abraham out of his land to begin a new people, particular blessing is promised in relation to universal intent. I will make you a great nation so that you will be a blessing. In you, all the families of the earth shall be blessed. When the Egyptian empire, feeling its power threatened by the growth of Abraham's descendants inside its domain, tightens its grip and imposes carefully tailored ethnic cleansing, God intervenes. God not only liberates the Israelites through Moses, assuring their survival as a people, God also establishes ethical conditions aimed at guaranteeing their capacity to live out their calling among the nations. Embedded in the law is good news for everyday life. Within the covenant community, Religious commitment is inseparable from economic and ecological relations. Those of you that were here at chapel yesterday will remember, debts are to be canceled, land is to be returned to the original family, particularly the poor, the defenseless, and people whose circumstances have uprooted them from family, from native culture. Those are the people protected by the law. The alien whose presence might even threaten the identity and challenge the cultural patterns of God's people. The alien is to be given room at the table. Now let's fast forward several centuries and we find Jesus again at the table of the Pharisee. The Jewish people are now under the iron rule of Rome which has enslaved many and destroyed entire villages. Repression and taxation are running families into debt and hunger. They're ripping at the very texture of their communities with the connivance of political and religious rulers. In these days of uncertainty and massive threat to their identity and survival, Jesus prophetically reminds his fellow Jews of who they are a community of mutual concern held together by God's sustaining hand in order to illustrate to others what God's good purposes look like here and now. In the imperial story of Rome and temple power, peasants, fishermen, women, and children are nobodies close to extinction, worth no more than their meager taxes. In God's story, they are welcome guests at the table of God's kingdom, as Jesus brazenly declares. The shocking turn of his story is that those who feel most secure in their right to belong and consequently take upon themselves the rules of judges and excluders are other, of others, those are precisely the ones who run the greatest risk of excluding themselves from the celebration. 
For I tell you, Jesus says, none of those who were invited will taste my dinner. Their self-assuredness blinds them from recognizing that there, sitting at the table with them, eating and drinking, is the Lord of the banquet, the only true host, and from accepting his invitation. Now back to Wheaton 2009, and a question. Who today is in and who is out? And I want to invite you for a moment to take off your shoes as established citizens of the most powerful nation on earth in order to catch a tiny, tiny glimpse of what it might be like to be one of the millions of women and men who are not allowed to belong. For starters, I'm going to ask you to do something symbolic. Please reach into your pockets or your backpacks or your purses, and I mean this. I'm not asking for money, so don't worry. <laughs> Take out your license or your ID. Set it on the floor under your seat. Not in your hand. Don't, don't hold on to it. Now get out your health or insurance card. Take out your credit card, your ATM card. Take out your cash card. Put them all on the floor under your seat. in your hands, please. You no longer have the passports of plenty. Stripped of those security cards, without those documents, you have no name. You have no identity. You have no country to claim as your own. Now you're maybe a little more ready to walk the precarious, risky, sometimes deadly road of the immigrant. Now why would any Salvadoran, Ecuadorian, Argentine choose to walk this road to begin with? A story might help explain that the more appropriate question is not why, but why not? Maria gets up at 4 a.m. to make food for her three children before boarding the 5 o'clock bus into the city. At 7, she must be sitting in her assigned spot, hands on her sewing machine. Not her sewing machine, the company's sewing machine. She welcomes her 15-minute lunch break. It gives her time to go to the bathroom. Back to it until 7 p.m. and a two-hour bus ride home. She rounds up her kids off the street, heats up some tortillas with beans, cleans up, puts some clothes to soak. That's on the early days. Because when she's forced to work extra hours, no buses run until dawn. So she snatches some sleep on the floor under the company sewing machine and catches the 4 a.m. bus back home in order to cook for her kids and send them off to school and return to work. She can't be late or she'll get a cut in her paycheck of $28 a week. She can't afford to lose her job now that Ramon no longer sends her money. Five years have gone by with no word from him. Rumors have it he's made a new family in D.C. Now, Cousin Rose has written her, again, come, I've saved up for the coyote. You can pay me back bit by bit. I know people who can find you work. You can make $40 a day. What are you waiting for? 
Now, Maria's story is particular, but it's by no means exceptional. Millions of Latin Americans are seeking viable means of sustenance for themselves and their loved ones in places far from home. Take the case of El Salvador. The United Nations, the United Nations report says that those who find their way into the U.S. make six times more than those who stay behind. Why not come? So 700 Salvadorans emigrate every single day. Half of the number of people here, or a third, every single day. Most of them have no credit card, no health insurance, no passport of plenty. They simply have needs, dreams, unique gifts, and human weaknesses, just as you and me. Now, south of the border, our Latin American lands have received people from near and far. Added to the indigenous people through conquest, colonization, and waves of immigration have come merchants and missionaries, miners and mercenaries, filibusters and farmers, teachers, preachers, soldiers, and artists from the world round. Japanese Brazilians, Estonian Argentines, Chinese Peruvians, Syrian Salvadorans, U.S. Costa Ricans. The blends continue to this day. Latin America continues receiving guests, including multinational corporations, to which the U.S. has granted many of the rights of citizen and so constituted as persons. Of course, these immigrants need not produce papers on demand, ford rivers, or traverse deserts. And they're welcome, after all. What would Maria do for a living if the maquila, the textile fa factory, weren't there? And when these guests choose to migrate to greener profits, the goods they engender are swaddled in protections. Their powerful benefactors secure the necessary travel documents. Their earnings need no exit visa. And thousands of Marias get left behind again and again, unless they choose to join the 700, risk being raped and burglarized along the way, dehydrating in the desert, or being detained upon entry, being exploited or deported as unwanted guests who have violated the laws of the land. Meanwhile, the laws of our land south of the border are being tweaked and massaged, des designed and redesigned to accommodate free trade agreements that clear the way for these people who are here today and leave tomorrow, briefcases full of profits and the hopes of Maria's children. Our borders, our sovereignties and the security of our people are made fluid and relative to bigger purposes. Pathways are being constructed, cutting across traditional boundaries from Puebla, Mexico to Panama, through the whole of Central America in the pursuit of what's built as a greater good. Now we must ask, as God's people, do we not have greater grounds and resources for transcending humanly constructed boundaries for the sake of higher purposes? Are we who celebrate the transforming power of Jesus' re resurrection not equipped to imagine and construct realities other than those that already exist? If we've tasted God's love that in Christ has breached the greatest dividing line, the chasm that separated us from our maker, if we've experienced the welcoming embrace at God's banquet table, does that reconciliation not impel us in turn to become border crossers, reconcilers, breakers of exclusionary table manners ourselves? If we believe that in Christ there is no Greek, no Jew, can we allow our core identity to be determined by the circumstantial constraints of one humanly devised and militarily expanded nation state? Is that who we are? Is that our core identity? 
Are we truly entitled to class some as outsiders and exclude them from the very land their ancestors named? Los Angeles, California, Texas, Nevada, Arizona, y seguimos y seguimos. Or can we recognize ourselves as, as members of God's transnational family, which transcends geographic, historic, cultural, racial, gender, even religious barriers, as an expression of a kingdom that is not of this world, but has already broken into it? If we acknowledge that God's spirit grants people of all cultures and languages unique gifts and rich insights, must we acquiesce to the prevailing stereotypes and prejudices that today reinforce exclusion and leave us all so much poorer in our churches, in our cities, in this country? Might we not celebrate the liberating impact of brothers and sisters in Christ who in the past struggled to ensure that slaves, women, African Americans be recognized as full citizens by following their example, envisioning today new ways of belonging? Most communities only grant space at the table to like-minded, like-looking, like-speaking, like-thinking people. But as followers of Jesus, we're called to step forth, unafraid of mixing with the wrong people, to stand in the interstices, in those cracks in society, between belief and unbelief, between purposeful and aimless living, between community and disintegration, between the global and the local, between people and nature, between haves and have-nots, between power and vulnerability, between north, south, east, west. In conclusion, the characters in Axel's film, in Babette's Feast, discover, or rather are discovered by, the good news of healing, abundant and undeserved grace when they share in Babette's lavish feast. In contrast, today's economic globalization accompanied by the individualistic and materialistic culture of its mostly Western proponents is threatening the relational and creational capacity of people undermining community life and plundering the environment the globe over. No longer able to support their families locally or ravaged by violence and exclusion, millions of people emigrate or wander the world as refugees. Thousands of women are left alone with their children in crowded cities. Families are torn apart, and so is the entire ecosystem. Land is gouged by mining, rivers and air are polluted by waste with no respect for its integrity or sustainability. Even so, that is not the whole story. There is good news. The good news is that contrary to most expectations, true gospel witness in the world does not rest on power or on the structures of Christendom, but on sharing in the passion of Jesus. Have we captured a vision of the table of God's kingdom? Have we submitted to Christ's sovereignty and been filled by the Holy Spirit? Then we can and we must celebrate our unmerited inclusion at the table of God's kingdom by welcoming people who look, think, speak, and eat differently than us. We must take the risk of confronting any power that excludes or deprives people of their rightful presence at the table. Dare we stand in the often painful place of the prophet, confessing and denouncing personal, national, class, ethnic, and tribal values and practices that counter God's good purposes for all people, even at the risk of exclusion, of ridicule, of persecution, or death. Right here on Wheaton College campus, or in downtown Chicago, 
in our churches, in our cities. Dare we? Dare we must and dare we can because pain, injustice, and abuse of creation are not the whole story. If we dare to welcome our lives, along with those of brothers and sisters from the world round, can, by God's grace, write another part of God's good story. Blessed are those who eat at the table of God's kingdom. Amen. For information on this or other video programming from Wheaton College, please call 630-752-5061 or email wetn at wheaton.edu. A guide to WETN video programming is available at wetn.org.